Anyway, so I'm going to talk about the work. I'm going to talk about uh, some of my influences. Um, I'm a maker of comics and various types of narratives. Um, my background is in graphic design. Uh, I teach design history, uh, applied semiotics, design methodology, design, 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 right? But I'm also interested in like social design, like designs around race, around intersectional identity politics, those types of interesting designs as well, right? So I'm going to start with talking about the idea of the cipher, right? The cipher back to here, right? Um, any hip hop fans in the audience? Side with me? Okay, yes, like yes. All right, so, so you know what a cipher is, right? You spark a cipher. It's a circle of rappers or MCs who are playing off of each other, usually in a battle format, right? Where you're trying to like uh, show that you have the best, uh, the, best the best skills as an MC, right? But it's also a circle, right? And so I like this idea of thinking about the influences that led me back to where I am now, which is to a certain degree uh, home, right? So I'm going to start at home. Um, I think a lot about hip hop and home and different types of like uh, spatial representations. And uh, I'm from Mississippi originally. Uh, I grew up in this place called The Sticks, <laughs> in, like off in the cut. And um, this place called uh, Florida, Mississippi. Uh, it's an agrarian space about 15 miles north of Jackson, uh, this, which is the capital of Mississippi. And so I literally grew up in the middle of a cotton field, like for real. Like not even like the kind of... Uh, stereotypical ideas, but like literally in the middle of a cotton field. And one of my favorite things was to stargaze, actually. I used to love to lay on a barn. I know it sounds very Andrew Wyatt, but it's actually what I used to do. Um, and gaze at the stars and think about my connection to them and think about what these other spaces are um, that are out there, right? And when I was introduced to, to hip hop as a, as, a, as a series of like cultural making uh, ideologies, it came to me through visual culture, right? Through um, MTV. My first thing that I, I watched was uh, Aerosmith and, uh, and Run DMC walking this way. You know, the, 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 uh, anyway, um, I really love that stuff, right? But because there weren't any like subways to tag in the middle of a cotton field somewhere, right? But I love the culture. I love the idea of how it functions. So I call myself a CJ. So this notion of like sampling and remixing, re juxtaposition of ideas, how these t different types of making inform my practice, the way I look at like research, that kind of thing. But it all started with, uh, uh oh, technical problems. Like yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm like, all right, with these individuals, right? My grandmother and my mother. The first artist that I encountered, right? I was raised by my grandmother and my mom. Um, Sherry Mae Thompson, also known as Momo. Everybody else called her Big Mama. I got to call her Momo. Uh, Janie Mae, my mom. They messed me up pretty good. Let me tell you how. <laughs> so now looking back at my research, I realized that my grandmother probably was a kanji woman. She probably was. Like she had these particular ideologies and superstitions that I think were directly connected to kanji culture, root work, uh, hoodoo culture, that kind of thing, which has been influenced in a lot of the work that I've been doing fairly recently. My mother just liked really cool stuff, and she shared it with me. I pretty much grew up in grind houses, you know, second run movie theaters. Anything that was violent, had a ninja in it, we were probably going to watch it. Oh my God, if it had blood and ninja in the title, we were definitely going to watch it, right? And we'd have discussions about these particular ideas. Um, and I think it's because, uh, and I didn't know my real grandfather at the time, but my, 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 my mother's father was murdered, right? And this is important for, for, later, for, for, for later on, and um, violently. And I think, and this is me just thinking back through this stuff, thinking about how those stories deal with trauma or unpack particular types of cathartic ways of looking at trauma, right? And I think that she was doing like conspicuous consumption because we watched a lot of horror movies. It's probably stuff that I really shouldn't have been watching, but we had like long protracted conversations about it, you know? So imagine like kid growing up in the middle of the country, collecting like bugs and thinking about stories, right? Looking at stars, listening to a hoodoo lady. That's how I ended up in this space, right? So the cipher starts here, right? So um, recently, a lot of my work has been associated with what's been called Afrofuturism, basically black science fiction, black speculative culture production. Um, and it started with these particular images. Um, I started thinking about um, the fungibility of the black body, the, the replication of black stereotypes in popular media, and how they just keep popping up. I'm kind of a stereotype hunter, actually. You know, hunt them down unpack them, try to figure out what they are, how they function, that kind of thing. So I was doing a, uh, I was on a, um, 
the first diversity scholar in residency at, at uh, James Madison University. You know how they have to like slide diversity in there so they can get it funded? You know, I was the first one though. So I was there for two weeks, right? And you get a show as well. So I went to do a show in Japan. I was curating a show over there. And I was really influenced by um, robots and how they dealt with this idea of like a constructed body or they dealt with this notion of like how the, how the black body becomes like an extension or, or an artifice that's connected to colonialism, that kind of like the soft machine, like literally the soft machine. And how like when somebody created a, a cotton gin, it was really like an upgrade, right? Oh, we can just throw away that old technology. We have a new thing now, right? What are we gonna do with these guys? So anyway, so this, this particular uh, se this series is called um, Matters of the Fact. I named it after Franz Fanon's The Fact of Blackness. Highly influenced by like uh, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto as well, but also started looking at how if you're a black cyborg and you're connected to a system of oppression, then maybe it's not so much, maybe it's not a good thing to be a cyborg, right? So I, started, I thought about this series for like about four months and I just kind of simmered on it. There's 70 of these images, I created them in four days. It was almost like they just came out of me, you know, and it's kept making, kept making, back breaking. I didn't get up, you know, I barely rested, I just made images, right? And so they started talking about like uh, reappropriation of older images around blackness, uh, systemic issues around oppression, but also um, how black people in America connect to Africa through buying uh, commodities that aren't necessarily con connected to um, their actual uh, tribe of origin or space of origin, but kind of represent and uh, in do an indexical way, you know, a connection to Africa, right? And you sell that, and we buy it and sell that, you know. And so this idea of the commodity of blackness and, and how these particular things keep popping up. But these are called matters of the fact. These like really black cyborgs, where I kind of started thinking about these ideas. And um, one of my friends who's Africanist looked at him, she says, oh, these are Afrofuturists. And I was like, you're making up words. <laughs> what is that thing that you said? Afro, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, these are Afrofuturists. I was like, okay. So I started doing research in that area. And before you know it, I was like, okay, this actually is something that is uh, a mode of cultural production that's been around for a while. Um, particularly when you're thinking about like the idea of technology as an extension of, of identity, which I think is fascinating. So, of course, these are all based off of stereotypes, pushed jungle bunnies, and uh, that's called Baker's Burden, right? So those, those types of images. And again, there's like 70 of these, and this is just like a snippet of them. One of the things that was really interesting, again, about it is like the, the replaceability, the fungibility of the black body, how like one particular part could just be like place for another during slavery, right? And so that was actually part of it as well. The other thing I've been doing a lot of is book cover design. You know, I'm your book cover guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a uh, trained as a designer. Like I designed these books as well as like helped put them together. Um, I'm really into like book design, uh, material culture, that kind of thing. And so I get tapped to do a lot of book design. So some of these, uh, some, some of my colleagues are, um, will hit me up and I'll just do like a lot of illustration work and that kind of thing. So practice-wise, I'm still an active uh, freelancer. So I do like a lot of freelance work uh, dealing with like promotional per work, usually around like the black speculative idea. Um, as far as like process-wise, I still do a lot of drawing uh, by hand. I was cl classically trained as a, my minor is in drawing. So I do like a lot of figure drawing, but I also do a lot of manipulation through digital technology. So I use Photoshop, Illustrator, all the whole like creative suite package, right? And also design my own cover. That's my collection. As you notice, I like sampled my own work too. The idea of like sampling and remixing is something that's really interesting to me. Um, this is from a series that I did for uh, this thing we did called Black Geek Week at University of Illinois. I used to teach at University of Illinois uh, for eight years. I was there. I was contacted by the, uh, the Black House. That's the, uh, the Cultural Studies Center for uh, African American uh, Studies. And they wanted to do this week-long celebration of various types of black nerd culture. So we looked at black engineers, physicists, uh, comics, everything, and just kind of did this celebration. And these are some of the series uh, that I did for that. It comes to black comics. So what started me thinking about this was um, I was working on a show that was a response to the Masters of American Comics show, which was in 2005 out of uh, the Hammer Museum out west. 15 of the greatest cartoonists to ever touch a quill pen, 
no women in the show. I was like, okay, so you can't be a master? Okay. So these are the masters of American comics, but, you know, Wendy Peeney's not in the show, or, um, or um, other female artists, no non-female artists in the show. So anyway, um, there were also no people of color in the show, and also it talked about a particular type of, type of comic that was being talked about in that show, uh, as far as like from a particular era. Um, a lot of people I really love, like Jack Kirby, who was a huge influence of mine, um, Walt Kelly, you know, Joe Simon, people like that. But not, um, not the, uh, the Brothers Hernandez, for instance, were not in there, from Love and Rockets. And I, not even Scott McCloud, though, who's like one of the big comics theorists, right? So I was like, okay, what were the criteria for this? <laughs> you know, I don't get it. Uh, Chris Ware was in there, but again, those particular artists were responding to a particular subset of a type of comic book. Now, I did kind of uh, misrepresent the fact that there weren't any people of color in the show. There was George Harriman, who was actually passing for white, actually. He's actually, they thought he was Greek, you know, but he used to do Crazy Cat back in the day. It's like 1928, he's the Crazy Cat. So other than that, you know, so me and my friend Damien started working on a show called Out of Sequence, which I don't have images from because I don't want to go into it too much, but we were looking at diversity writ large, like not only who was making the comics, how they were being produced, you know, gallery comics, web comics, basically the idea of the persistence of a particular type of mediation. You know, that, that's what we were really interested in. Um, so instead of 15 artists, we had like over 60 artists, 214 pieces, and it was at the University of Illinois. Um, it was probably one of, I thought it was one of the most innovative co comic shows ever, but it happened in the middle of a cornfield. I don't know if you've been to the University of Illinois, <laughs> but if it was on, other, on, each co if it was on uh, either coast, I think it probably would have been a bigger show. A, big, a bigger show. So what starts to happen is um, once we like, realized that we were going to do this show, we realized we had never curated a show before. So we did a practice show at Jackson State called Other Heroes. And it was supposed to be a small show to kind of like practice curation. It ended up being 148 pieces, like over 20 or so artists. It was nuts. But it was all African-American artists and talking about stereotypes in comics. This particular book kind of came out of that discussion. You know, we didn't want to ghettoize black comic book artists, but what started happening was we were looking at this culture that, that was kind of simmering since the 1990s, like early 90s, that a lot of people call the black age of comics. And, and, and so the gentleman that coined that particular term was Turtle on Lee, who was a black comic book publisher himself and distributor. It's kind of like the master P of comics. What he would do is get content by black creators and literally like drive them around from space to space and sell them out of the back of his car. Right? So he was like, I've heard about the Golden Age comics, heard about the Silver Age comics, Bronze Age comics, what about the Black Age? And so before you know it, you have these independent black spaces that are selling independent comic books. You know? And that's what this is a collection of. Right? It's out of print, unfortunately. So. The other thing is um, I love collaborating. Right? So I do a lot of collaborative uh, uh, works. I love working with movers, like dancers and choreographers. Uh, I love making work about translations between movement and uh, other types of visual culture. Um, so this is uh, Cynthia Oliver. Uh, she is a teacher of dance at University of Illinois. And we were having um, dinner. And over wine, we were talking about the, the differences or the connections between comics and uh, dance. You know? I didn't realize at first that they don't have like uh, dance classes. They have composition classes. You realize that? They actually have composition classes. Choreography literally means dance writing, right? So I like this idea of the body as a dance, as a, as a, as a mark-making instrument, right? So that's, that's a graphic design tool right there. So how do we deal with that particular space? So this was called uh, Closure for Blood, Gutters for Veins. I think, I don't know how many glasses of wine we were into before we came up with this, but it was like about a 15-minute presentation of her student dancers. Um, it was the first time I did this kind of stuff, so I had to beat it. Every curtain call, I, had, I designed uh, you know, costumes, I did like a lot of the scenery, that kind of thing. And this was a few years ago. But I love working with, uh, I love working with Cynthia, but I also loved working with uh, dancers in general. So we're working on a new piece called Virago for a space in Vermont that deals with uh, Jamaican masculinity, politics, and uh, visual culture. She's of Jamaican descent, so a lot of her movement vocabulary are, is from the Afro-Caribbean uh, space. And just sees uh, stills just from the performance, which I kind of love as stills, you know. That brings us to Junkanoo. This is a project that I worked on with um, Akitha Carey and Deborah Dudley. Uh, again, I was thinking about this idea of translation of choreography as a, as a writing instrument. So 
Um, I know you guys do this all the time. We put like mapping things over people's bodies. It probably costs like a gajillion dollars, right? Gajillion simoleons, yeah, right? All right, so this cost like 10, 10 bucks. <laughs> I went to like the dollar store and I took these lights, put them all over our body and uh, filmed her at low shutter speed, which you probably are familiar with, right? So by themselves, they're really interesting compositions, right? But you can actually start to see some of the calligraphic motion that's happening, right? Now, Akitha Carey created her own dance vocabulary called Carib Funk, where she took like Afro-Caribbean movement vocabularies and fused it with modern dance. So she's trying to figure out ways to codify that and kind of disperse it, right? And so I was like, well, let's, let's do some experiments with different ways of like translating you know, to, into, into, into other forms, right? So what I did is I sampled uh, snippets from these, uh, these motions, from these light forms, and just created a typeface called Jukia. And I based some of this stuff off of uh, the Caribbean, uh, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Bahamian uh, carnival space, uh, which is called Junkanoo, which is where we got the title of the uh, project from. And I just started doing some experiments with uh, these typographic forms. I want to do some more with these, but you know, these are just some experiments that we did based off of the translation of like this objectified like female body into like this really symbolic kind of a symbolic language. That brings us to Black Kirby, which is probably like one of the most uh, extensive like ongoing uh, collaborative projects that I've worked on. So I was talking to Stacy Robinson, who's my collaborator with Black Kirby, and this is around the time that. Any comic scholars? Comic scholars in the audience, right? There are some people, right? You remember the, um, the lawsuit that uh, was going on between Jack Kirby's uh, family and, and Disney as far as like remuneration for his, for his, uh, for his uh, uh, creations for Marvel Comics in particular, right? This is around the time the first Avengers movie came out and made like a billion dollars worldwide. <laughs> I'm like a billion dollars, right? So I don't know if you know or not, but a lot of artists are still paid in the comics industry page by page. They get a page rate. And of course, if you're working for like the big two, DC and Marvel, then you're getting, you know, well, you're basically, just, you're working on their characters. You don't own those characters, right? And so Jack Kirby, even though he was like one of the greatest cartoonists to ever live and was really like part of creating like, you know, an entire universe. We're talking the Silver Surfer, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men. I don't know if you're familiar with these at all, right? You know, you watch comic book movies? Okay, thank you, all right. <laughs> you know what those are? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so, so he co-created all this stuff, right? And family was like, well, I know it's work for hire, but maybe you could break us off some money. You know, that would be nice. And they're like, no, we're not gonna do that because we're Disney and we're evil, so we're not gonna do that. All right, so <clears throat> Stacy and I didn't think that was right. We was like, you know what, that's not right. They treating that brother like he was black. So, black Kirby. <laughs> it was like, hey, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> Black Kirby. So then we started thinking about the connections between some of the metaphorical things that they were talking about in the X-Men. The fact that they did create the first major black superhero, the Black Panther, four months before the, uh, the Black Panthers called themselves that, by the way, which I thought was extremely interesting. So a lot of those particular types of uh, connections we just made more explicit, right? There's this kind of thing about like, you know, Malcolm X being like Magneto and you know, Charles Xavier, you know, being Dr. King, which is totally, that's probably not right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's interesting though, right? It's interesting, you know? And so they actually created some really problematic characters too. Like why is the black racer, the, the spirit of death, black? I don't understand. What, first it's like, why is he on skis? That's the first thing. But then also why is he this black character, you know, death? Anyway, so the conflation of death and blackness is something that's like historical, right? The other, the other fact is that we look at Forever People, there's a character called Viking the Black. And he happens to be the black character. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting as well. <laughs> so, but anyway, so we started thinking about like Black Kirby in this alternative universe where he was informed by you know, black power politics, because guess what? In the 60s, that kind of stuff was jumping off, right? Maybe instead of being informed by you know, Norse mythology, he was, he was informed by uh, Afro-Caribbean mythology or like West African mythology. So, so the mighty Thor becomes the mighty Shango. Same, same God. You know, he has an axe instead of a hammer, but you know, the same, same kind of character. And then we started thinking about the constructions of monstrosity around blackness. So instead of the Incredible Hulk, he's the unkillable buck, right? Which is actually extremely telling when you look at like some of the descriptions of the black body now, particularly if you look at like Darren Wilson's description of Michael Brown when he's, when he's shooting him. He was a demon, 
He was a monster, right? So this idea of the golem from Jewish mythology and how it, again, becomes an idea around the grotesque, right? And how these particular ideas start to kind of play themselves out. And Jack Kirby's work had all kinds of golems in it, right? Like you have the thing, you know, it's a golem. He was Jack Kirby, you know, <laughs> he was pretty much like this bulky rock guy, right? That's Jack Kirby. That's how he saw himself. So anyway, so these are um, remixes of these particular types of ideas and just kind of sampling or mixing uh, Jack Kirby's aesthetic, but also adding our own uh, influences from Afrofuturism, from hip hop, from black power politics. That's the Uncanny Kingsman, you know. And then it's funny because uh, you guys know Scott Free? He's this character called uh, Mr. Miracle. He's the ultimate escape artist. I was like, oh, let's call him Gil Scott Free. And then my friend was like, you know what, you should have a Jill Scott Free. I was like, you know what, you're right. And that's kind of like how it was. It was like a really interactive thing. But this idea of like, you know, this black character who's the ultimate escape artist was just, I mean, that's too good to pass up. The Unkillable Buck Returns. Sorry. Yeah, so our process was this. I mean, sometimes I would draw something and pass it off to Stacy. He would mess around with it, send it back to me. There's a lot of call and response involved and that kind of thing. So as far as like the critical making aspect of it was really fun. So over a month and a half, we made 120 images. And they, we've actually like shown this, you know, worldwide actually. So, um, and we're actually starting to talk about stories. So this is Dark Side remixed as Black Hand Side. This particular piece was like actually eight feet tall. It was a, we call it the Funky Totem series, that kind of thing. We also did these abstract comics. Uh, abstract comics are basically like narratives that are sequential in nature, but actually not objective. So this was influenced by DJ Spooky, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, media theorists, but also he's a good DJ, you know? <laughs> so, and so this whole piece was like inspired by some of his quotes. So it's like the only finished comic in the whole series, about 36 pages, right? Which brings us to Kid Code. What was, gonna, what was happening with um, the Black Kirby stuff is that we were making these kind of prototypes of, of magazines that could have been, or that, that would be, or might have been, right? And people were like, well, so when's that, black, when's that, uh, that book, book coming out? I was like, uh, it's an art piece. It's, a, it's like pop art, you know? Um, when's that Major Sankofa piece coming out? I said, no, it's not a book. It's actually not a book, no. And then we started thinking like, okay, well, let's make some original books. So, we started making original content as Black Kirby. So Kid Code is really influenced by my love for time travel stories. I'm a massive Doctor Who fan, Mahuvian, straight out of Gallifrey. I love that stuff. I love it. I grew up reading that work. I mean, excuse me, watching that work. And uh, it just totally uh, influenced the way I look at like sci-fi. So that's why I had this long scarf. It's based to Tom Baker. That's the only Doctor Who. Sorry. You can fight about it later, but that's my doctor. Um, anyway, so if you take like Doctor Who and you mix it with like Green Lantern and Africa Ambata and like Rem LZ a little bit, there you go. So the story is like this. I'm going to break down the story and pitch it to you. Um, at the beginning of time, there was the God MC, right? God MC spoke the world into existence. He had this crew called Lords of Light that hung out with them. Some of them were haters. So what ends up happening is they sampled his voice, they sample God's voice, and they remix the entire universe into what this mess is, the dark mix, right? So his other homeboy, Father Time, created the Knights of the Infinite Digging. See, Kid is actually a title, Knights of the Infinite Digging. So basically, they travel through this like time quilt that's, that's uh, constructed by these four DJs called the Unfatable Four. The quilt is called the Incredible. So he jumps through these pieces, and they're trying to collect up the shards of God's original voice to remix it to the original format. So it's almost like a shout out to, it's like a shout out to Afrofuturism, but also to um, these notions of like old school hip hop. And there's an, there's an anti-capitalist narrative too, because the main villain, the hater, is called uh, the power. You know, so as you can see, as a grill, this is cream, which is cash rules everything around me, right? And so they're trying to stop the, uh, the power from remixing the universe and, and stopping the universe using channel zero. Because every time we get close to stopping him, he resets everything. So we have to find Channel Zero, stop that. So it's like this kind of Star Wars narrative too. It's, not, it's, it's a big mix mash of like a lot of different things. And the aesthetic is pretty much based off of some of the stuff we were like really into with like Jack Kirby's work, but also like graffiti. You know, the idea of like the formal notions of graffiti. So it's like all over the place. 
And our first book is like 40 pages long. And people are like, oh my God, it's like dollar ninety nine for like 40 pages. What are you gonna do next with this? So right now we're working on the second part. You know? And it's published by Rosarium Publishing, which is one of the most progressive uh, publishers of like science fiction and fantasy right now. They do like comics, but they also do um, original prose work. Very diverse writers there, you know, from various backgrounds. What I love about it, they have like a kind of a women's initiative. They want to actually publish more women who are writing, you know, science fiction and fantasy. So it's a great, uh, great company owned by Bill Campbell. And he did some of the spreads from Kid Code. It brings us to Night Boy. So I don't know if you've been watching the news, but it seems that there's been a lot of uh, police brutality against the black body in major cities, right? Um, so this particular character is in response to that. Uh, character's real name is Jamal Jemison, he's from Chicago. Really big comics fan himself, artist. <clears throat> been sketching this image of himself, actually. Uh, him, and his him and his cousin uh, are coming out of a comic book store, and they get into it with a cop. Cousin is killed. Jamal is injured. While he's uh, conv convalescing in, in the hospital, he's visited by these two night spirits. Um, and given this mantle of the, uh, uh, basically like the paladin of the dark. His powers come from deferred dreams. So, and he also is a shadow bender. So he can actually take shadows, bend them to his will. But basically all the potential energy of his cousin's life cut short, uh, his father's dreams, his grandfather's dreams, he can actually call upon those particular powers to actually aid him. So he's a shadow, shadow shifter. But really what he is is like kind of a gargoyle character. So he guards us from these night spirits. And that's an, another project we're working on right now. It's gonna be a hybridized form, so it's gonna be like uh, graphic novels, but also prose as well. What I love about it is that a lot of it's gonna be about the, the family. You know, so that's his little sister who's a brilliant, brilliant girl who discovers that he actually is night boy. So you can ask about it, we can talk about it. <laughs> another thing I was really proud of uh, was Artists Against Police Brutality, which is a comics uh, anthology. Uh, my friend Bill Campbell called me after the Eric Garner non-decision and was irate, uh, woke me up out of a nap. I don't get a lot of those. And um, he, was, he wanted to do something about it. So basically what we started working on was a collection of stories about police brutality from comics, but also analysis from like scholars. And all the proceeds are going to the Innocence Project. So that's a current project that's up right now as well. 61 artists and participants, excuse me, like in scholars. And again, this is from Rosarium Publishing, which he named after his daughter, by the way. His daughter's name is Rose, so that's kind of cool. This is one of my favorite and most painful pieces. This is by um, uh, Barbara Brandon Croft. And I don't know if you can see the date on this, but she's talking about police brutality, but the date is like 2000, right? It almost didn't make the, it almost didn't make the volume until I showed it to Jason Rodriguez, and I was like, dude, look at the date on this. It's like 16 years ago. Right? Still the same problem. Still the same issue. Still the same assassination of the black body. And so we were dealing with this with the comics piece, which I love about the fact that comics are so irreverent and they can deal with these types of issues. I'm sorry about harping about it, but it's what I study for obvious reasons. It's part of what I do. So well, it's like looking at the construction and the destruction of the black body. Oh, A.B. Jeter stuff is so good. Look at that. She has, actually does like a zombie comic book. It's called uh, Nothing Good Happens at 3 a.m. in the morning. Or Nothing Good, it's so good. <laughs> anyway, and it's a portrait that's kind of become like the, uh, it's by Ashley Woods, and uh, she did like these caricatures of some of the victims, like the most famous victims, you know. What's really interesting about this book, though, is by, it just came out, and since the Eric Garner incident up to the publication, which I think is where I met S Sasha during Mice, right? Um, over almost 900 people have died since then at the hands of police brutality. So, and those people are listed in the back. So, so again, I've been doing a lot of Afrofuturism covers. For some reason, I kind of stumbled into uh, helping to shape the aesthetic of like what's been looked at as Afrofuturism these days. So, these are some of the covers. Uh, Octavius Boot is really interesting because it starts to deal with the idea of how these various like grassroots black political movements start to intersect with black speculative culture, right? And so I've been thinking about this notion of what I call the black speculative arts movement and how it kind of parallels some of the things that were happening in the black arts movement, which was the, uh, the sister to the black power movement, right? And so me and my friend, Ronaldo Anderson, who is editing 
this two volume uh, piece from Lexington Books with Charles Jones, he's calling it Afrofuturism 2.0. So he's looking at Afrofuturism and black of culture through various lenses. So we have someone writing about religion, from performative culture, from, you know, from aesthetics, from aesthetics uh, various types of writing and, and epistemologies looking at this culture, as a, looking through this culture as a lens. So. And so uh, we put together a manifesto that we're kind of passing around right now. He also is the co-curator uh, of the Unveiling Vision show, which I'll talk about in a second. But this is again from uh, Rosarian Publishing. They're, this is the first book that actually got them some notoriety, dealing with uh, black speculative culture and black speculative writing from various standpoints. And so it's an uh, anthology. Um, as Ed stated earlier, one of the things that I've been interested in is building community spaces. Um, I'm really into Theaster Gates right now. I think I mentioned to some other people earlier, but <clears throat> his process is building community. He's, he's, he has his MFA in like um, studio art. He's a potter and he's in Chicago. And what he's been doing is using his money from making art to buy old dilapidated buildings in Chicago and revamping them and turning them into community art spaces. What I've been doing recently is thinking about uh, creating these kind of think tanks and spaces where uh, collaborative uh, energy can be shared, well, both creatively, politically, uh, around black speculative culture. So Astro Blackness was something I founded at, at Loyola Marymount with Adelifu Nama, who wrote this book called Black Space. Uh, he's a film studies professor. And also he did this book called Super Black, which is about, <laughs> which is about black superheroes, actually, too. Um, and so we started working out uh, how to go about this kind of like colloquium. And we've done it for two years. And we have a spinoff. I'm going to talk, talk about that in a second. Um, we're going to do a third one next year. And it's in, it's in LA. And some of the top like scholars and creators in this genre come and talk about this work you know, in that space. Um, Nalo Hopkinson calls it the Black Sci-Fi Church, because it's kind of like what it is. Um, the other thing that's been happening is that uh, this black underground independent uh, comics culture has um, cons. There's a convention circuit, actually. The, lar the oldest one is in uh, Philly. It's called the East Coast Black Age of Comics Convention. It's been around for 14 years, right? You ever seen it, ever heard of it? No, maybe? Yeah, it's there, it's there though, right? It's right in front of you. Um, there's also Kids Comic Con created by Alex Simmons. Uh, there's one called MechaCon that's in Detroit. There's another one in Detroit called the, uh, the Motor City Black Age of Comics. There's one in Atlanta that's been around for eight years called OnyxCon. There's a system of these particular conventions, and I've added a couple more. So a few years ago, we founded uh, the Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg, where uh, me, Jonathan Gales, uh, Deirdre Holman, who works there, and also Jerry Kraft, who's been doing Black, Black Comic Book Day at Human Book, Festi book, book um, Store, which is now unfortunately defunct founded the Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg Center. The first one brought in about 1,200 people, and it was wild. It was like the Schomburg was not ready for that. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to that space, but they were not ready for that kind of geek geekery to jump off at a library. At a, we're talking about a space where Langston Hughes' ashes are buried in the, in the foundation, right? And comic book geeks, and like, what is going on? So it, yeah, so, uh, yeah it, it was pretty wild. So then. Um, We've done a couple more. This, this was the fourth annual. I'll show you some pictures from that. And I was like, OK, well, let's see if we can do something on the West Coast. So I was working. I do a seminar uh, with the uh, MFA program on comics uh, in, uh, Calif excuse me, in San Francisco. And one of my best friends is married to Aaron Grizzell. His name is Colette. And he is the CEO of the MLK NorCal, which is like the, the MLK Foundation of San Francisco. And it's pretty big, actually. They do a massive MLK uh, uh, festival there. We're talking like 30, 40,000 people come out. They do a march and they end up at the Yerba Buena Art Center and they split off into different festivals. So the Black Comic Arts Festival is the 12th festival that they're doing. So that he's over all these festivals simultaneously. He's pretty much a one person uh, you know, uh, enterprise. <laughs> it's pretty wild. So our first one brought in about 1,600 people. You know? um, so what I did was I, I do this one in New York and Harlem. I jump on a plane in the middle of that one. I fly out west. It's, and so I do both on MLK weekend, and then I pass out <laughs> later, because this is pretty wild. Um, this year, these are the posters from this year. So at the Schomburg, we had about 6,000 people. Uh, Maya was there, actually, and, was, and complaining about the, <laughs> about the amount of people. Yeah, and I want that to happen, because here's the thing. Um, 
one of the one of the misnomers about like black folk is that we don't like science fiction, we don't like fantasy, we don't like comic books, we don't like any of this stuff. And I'm like, no, I was born and raised on this stuff. This is what I'm, this is what my culture is. And so you had this massive turnout. Um, I told the dean earlier, it was like the new iPad or the iPhone was dropping or something. People were queued up, right? You know, trying to get up in there, you know, to buy independent black comic books. You know, um, it was out of control, and we had. Uh, pieces about Afrofuturism. We had th we had a panel about publishing. We had a whole panel about Black geek culture and and the fact that it's being it's a now it's a new journalistic uh, uh, enterprise. You have all these podcasts and magazines and everything that's covering this, you know. And it's funny though because when I've been interviewed by major news sources about diversity in comics, right, and they want me to talk about Black Panther and Falcon being Captain America and all this kind of stuff, but I always mention this culture. And they never, they never published me talking about this culture, right? I talked to this woman, African American reporter from CBS, for two hours, two hours about this. And I said, sister, that's what I said, I said, sister, she was sister. I know you're not gonna, I know you're not gonna be able to use this because it's not talking about the mainstream. But if you really wanna see diversity of representation of us, come to this space. I saw two Marvel editors at this thing. You know, it was pretty interesting. And they were like, what is going on? <laughs> right. Because David Walker was there, um, who was writing like you know he was writing Shaft and he was writing like Cyborg and other things, right? These are some of the people there, you know, just kind of showing off the shirts. These are my publisher. That's Bill Campbell. That's Jason Rodriguez. This is uh, the, the the Rosarium uh, table. Some of the wares there. You have Black Panther outside with the queue, see, in the middle of Harlem. This this particular line was wrapped around the building a couple of times. Um, that's David Walker, uh, who is an avid, like, uh, independent uh, critic, scholar of, like, um, of uh, various types of media, actually, particularly film, and filmmaker, too. But he's writing, like, Power Man and Iron Fist. He just stopped writing Cyborg. He wrote the Shaft comic book based off the novels, and he's getting ready to write Nighthawk for Marvel. And he sold out by, like, 3 o'clock. He was sold out. Someone gave him a book, and he put it on his table. Someone tried to buy the book that someone gave him. It's like, because that... That's how much that particular crowd has been ignored, you know. And so these particular spaces are feeding um, that hunger. The other thing I did uh, was I co-founded SoulCon, which is the first black and Latino convention, which is at Ohio State University. Columbus, Ohio is a big comics town. That's where the, uh, the Cartoon Research Library is, the Billy Ireland. Um, so this was the first time that this has jumped off as a black and Latino independent con. Um, the next one is going to be October 14th. Um, numbers weren't as good, just for different reasons. But I think that by moving it to the library, it's going to be a, it's going to be a lot better. So it's always been green. It's already been green lit. Um, yeah, and it was it was it was a great time. So unveiling visions was a was a show that I took off uh, teaching to do um, at the Schomburg, and it was looking at the material culture and the ephemera around producing uh, black speculative culture. So like book cover design, poster designs. The other thing we were doing was like diegetic prototypes of things that were talked about in speculative fiction written by black people. Like for instance, I mentioned it earlier, like George Shiler's Black No More chair, the, sh the, the chair from like Black No More, the, 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 the story that uh, could turn black people into white people, but not quite, you know? <laughs> so we were like, well, what does that chair look like? Or the pig detector from, uh, from Amiri Baraka's story called uh, The Pig Detector. <laughs> so what does that look like, you know? Or the Afro horn from uh, Henry Dumas's piece, or even more recently, the megascope from this sci-fi story that W.B. Du Bois wrote in 1908 that they just discovered. It's an object. So what do those objects look like? We put those into this show. Using the, um, the trope of the data thief, right? The data thief was a construct, because it's a construct that came from this uh, documentary, came out in the late 1990s by John Confra that looked at, um, black digital music, right? It was called uh, The Last Angel of History. And the data thief was pretty much a time traveling archaeologist. He, he was a huge pleasure. Was a huge um, influence on Kid Code, actually, too, right? So uh, I'm losing people. Sue's asleep, sorry. <laughs> anyway. <work> yeah? <laughs> I know, that's true. There you go. Um, anyway, and I've had coffee, so I'm, like, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> What was interesting, though, is that we were uh, utilizing the technology. So all this stuff is like reprints of things, right? So 
we're utilizing this, the space as an archive. So what, is, what happens when someone who's an archaeologist becomes like a curator, a time traveling curator, right? Starts pulling from all these different spaces. And we're able to put up this really kind of robust show. Uh, about 10,000 people visited it in the shop, at the Schomburg. Um, it's a really fun show, and it's probably going to travel now, which I'm excited about. And right now, we're finishing up the publication. We have 15 really strong essays for the, for the piece. Um, I have to finish my intro. I've been working. So yeah. What we did is like we divided up all of the, um, these spaces. Uh, the Black Fantastic dealt with like Black Fantasy. But a space called Dark Matters that dealt with this construction that I call the ethnogothic. Uh, we had things dealing with like music and technology, you know, that kind of thing. So we'll try to look at all the different types of material cultures and how they informed, you know, uh, black cultural production in this space. I love the fact that you can see the archive and you can kind of see Aaron Douglas's work. I love the fact that you can see the past and the future sim and, the, and the present simultaneously and it's in a cipher itself, right? And it's some of the layout. Now, I have to, thought, I have to thank like, Isissa Kamada John, who's the new director of, of galleries there, because I wanted to be like a street scene. I wanted to be like opulent. Everything that you see, I wanted, I, I wanted to be three times bigger. <laughs> you know, I wanted people to walk in and be like, oh my god. You know, she would not allow me to do that, but that's cool. You know, so we, we worked out a, medi a, a medium, right? So one of the things, that, another thing I took off time to do is work on the adaptation of Octavia Butler's Kindred. I won't go into how I stumbled into that project, but I'm extremely grateful. I'm also like, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> because it's 240 page, full color book. Right now I'm in the middle of doing the breakdowns for the pages. And um, one big thing is that the, uh, the estate for Octavia Butler has already signed off on the book. So that was a big deal, you know? So, cause if they didn't like it, it was a no-go. And that is hours and I would have cried into my computer, but they liked it. So these are some of the early, uh, character sketches for Kindred, some of the main characters. And I'm going to show you pages from it. Like only the estate and some other people have actually seen pages from it. But that's Rufus and uh, Alice and other. These are early, early sketches. That's what the covers go look like. It's a prologue. You guys know the story? OK, thereabouts. So here's some of the early images of it. Can't wait to be done with this project. I'm excited about it. It's a lot of damn work, though. Because now, that, once I finish the breakdowns, I got to go back and draw everything over again and color it. I'm handling <laughs> all the artwork for it. So it's a labor of love, but it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of work. <laughs> but it's going to be cool because it's going to be um, it's supposed to come out next year. Uh, hardcover, really nice printing. Uh, it's going to be marketed internationally. It's going to be uh, it's a big deal. And it's probably in time for her. It would have been her 70th birthday actually. So that's going to be really cool. All right, so as, as a space, I think Afrofuturism has been used as kind of a catch-all for um, everything black and speculative, which I don't think is, not, is necessarily the case. Like Kindred, for instance, Octavia Butler herself calls it a dark fantasy. She actually frames it that way. It's not like people don't know how the time travel happens. All she knows is she's popping from one, from one time zone to the other. There's not a TARDIS, you know, a time machine that's active, right? Um, she's shifting because of this, this connection to a traumatic space, right? And so there are other narratives like that too, where this, this kind of time travel is happening, you know, mystically, right? So I started thinking about other ways of thinking about uh, black, the black speculative. And a lot of it came from looking at comics like Cloak and Dagger, right? Where you, it's a very problematic comic from the 90s <laughs> to deal with like, um, both racially and, and, and gender politics is very problematic, but you know, the black male is an open space. He's basically a, a, a disembodied cloak that eats you, you know, which is actually one of my influences for the whole, actually, too. Um, but it's a very gothic space, right? And gothic in a way that we're talking about like ideas around the other, around the grotesque, around the monstrous, uh, fic fictitious histories, um, those types of tropes of the gothic. And how like the Gothic as a space relate to black experiences in America in general, you know, or could be associated with those particular types of spaces. So stories like Candyman, which really is like an anti-miscegenation narrative, right? Um, Tanana Reeve Dew's work, who is the black female Stephen King, that's who she is. Um, Tales from the Hood, Sugar Hill, uh, the character from <laughs> Tales, what was it? Uh, oh my God, what's the name of it? Trilogy of Terror with the little Zuni doll. That's, Chasing down, you remember? Yeah, she's like, yeah. 
all those characters, they're problematic, but they're dealing with um, these really shadowed spaces that aren't really talking about science fiction and fantasy in, in the way that we're thinking about the future, right? But for some reason, they'll take like sunrise music and shove it under Afrofuturism. I think it probably fits there, but you know, spaces like, uh, like Daughters of the Dust, for instance, I think by Julie Dash, that to me is a gothic narrative. Like you have the present and the future and the past coexisting and the future is like haunting the present. It's like a wonderful movie, but it's kind of, it freaks you out, you know? And so a lot of it deals with like these like spiritual spaces that I don't think science fiction really readily deals with. I like this idea of like the ghost as a reified agent of trauma, right? And how do you do, deal with that? Beloved, for instance, by Toni Morrison, that's a scary story. That's a ghost story. The Ark of Bones by Henry Dumas, that's a ghost story. You know, dealing with like this idea of like the transatlantic slave uh, uh, enterprise and how that informs, you know, race in America, right? So that's what these particular pieces are. This is actually from a five part uh, visual essay I did for like uh, Obsidian Magazine about what I term as the ethnogothic, right? Which I've been kind of like obsessed with, so. So most of the projects that I'm dealing with right now are taking us back to Mississippi. So this particular character, his name is Frank Half Dead Johnson. He's the fictitious cousin of Robert Johnson, the blues man. What happens is due to a racialized violent issue, uh, episode, his family is killed. And so instead of wanting to be uh, a, a, virtu a virtuoso at, at the blues guitar, he wants revenge, which makes perfect sense. He wants justice, he wants revenge, he wants to, to be at peace in some fashion. So instead of, uh, so instead of like getting um, you know, this virtuosity with an with instrument, he wants to become a very powerful conjurer so that he can actually exact revenge against the people that kill his family. And that's what he does. And then what happens is he immediately regrets his decision, he figures out a way to like trick the devil into like uh, letting him out of his, uh, his agreement a little bit. He actually beats the devil at craps. Devil, seems like the devil can only throw sixes, so he, he tricks him. Um, and he moves to Chicago, you know, and to ply his trade. The devil's like, hey, you know what, I like, I like you, man. I'm gonna give you half of your soul back, thus the name Half Dead. And you have to work for me for like a couple hundred years uh, on this blues song I'm working on. Seems that souls resonate in a particular tonality. And he's composing a blues song for Rapture. So to a certain degree, uh, Frank is actually tracking down these souls for this, uh, this blues song. It's called the, the, the Low Down Devil Blues that he's trying to compose for the end of the world. And so this is the story I'm working with. That's Blue Hand Mojo. And what's really interesting, let me back up a couple. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, Ed, sorry. Ah, the noir. It's based off of Mamona Goresi's work. She does these beautiful pieces about, you know, black figures. But basically she's like a living like spirit tree. But the noir is in love with Frank. That's where all his powers come from. And so the idea is that his hand, which he like reaches into her to pull his power out, the more he uses his power, the more it creeps up over his body. And so what happens is uh, if he doesn't drink this elixir, he will actually be become just a story. And he has to live in the noir forever, you know, with her. So he's always trying to fight against that particular piece as well. But this is where all black creativity comes from. It's called the noir, it's a construction. Um, the spirit trees, of course, are informed by like hoodoo practices like catching evil spirits and things of that nature. And of course, he's covered with a quilt. And to backtrack, my mother and my grandmother were both quilters, so I actually keep seeing like the quilt popping up in my work. This teal color, haint blue, you guys know what a haint is? It's a ghost, haint, haunt, you know, but it's like, that's what we call them down south, haints. So the story is like this. When you see those houses down south painted with that color, they're tricking the spirits to go into, the, into that because they think that it's the sky, you know? And so now it's become like, oh, hey, blue. But no, actually, it's like we're trying to protect the house. Um, when I was growing up, most of the houses that we lived in had, were, were painted that color and also had like bridles and like um, horseshoes, right? Because horses were supposed to be uh, to ward off evil spirits, right? And it would stop hates from getting into the space, right? It's interesting. I love that kind of stuff like for like folklore, but I keep seeing how it like permeates a lot of the work that I'm working on right now. Um, I think my, let's see, so Box of Bones is a project I'm working on right now, too. It's probably like the largest uh, collaborative project I've ever worked on. Whenever I do my elevator pitch, I call it like uh, Afrocentric Hellraiser. Remember with Hellraiser? Okay, he's like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, so, um, so basically it goes like this. There's this, um, there's this, uh, uh, this black woman who is a, uh, uh, 
visual culture researcher at Berkeley. This is the character, her name's Lindsay Ford. She's studying folklore and she comes across this box that's described in various um, modes of her research uh, throughout the diaspora that it's a box of revenge or it's a box of pain. Some people call it the shadow box, some people call it the black box, but most people call it the box of bones. So the stories go throughout the diaspora that if something happens to you or your loved one, your need for revenge or anger calls the box to you and there's six spirits that live in the box and the, the right one will possess you, you exact your revenge and you owe it something. Sanity, body part, your loved one, maybe you gotta live in the box for a little bit. So it actually kind of plays around with the idea of like um, the differences between like morality and justice and all these different types of like really tense story notions, right? So all these characters are based off of uh, traditional like black stereotypes, like the black brute. That character's called the, um, oh my God, I forgot the name of the character. Hold up for a second. It's not the burden, the suffering, that's his name, the suffering. That's the dark, that's nobody, as in nobody knows the trouble I see, right? And that's the burden, which is pretty much like a cotton sack filled with like slave body parts. And it's always replenishing them, so it kind of creeps around. I wanted to make things that like would creep me out, which is hard, because I watch a lot of horror movies, so. The other thing is like, I wanted to design characters that if I drew them as shadows, you could see which one was coming to get you, right? I'm working with six different artists, and I'm working with uh, Ayize Jemai Everett, who is like an up and coming uh, science fiction fantasy writer out of the, the Bay Area. It's called Box of Bones. We're working on it right now. We're probably gonna kickstart it, take it to a publisher. He thinks that we could probably get it published by like Image Comics or something. I was like, Image is not gonna publish that damn thing. No one's gonna publish that. We have to publish it ourselves, right? Publish a book about black rage in a box? I, mean, I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't think so. You can do a Falcon book, not, not this though. The Night Doctor. The Night Doctor is based off the Plague Doctors, right? It's about medical apartheid, about the experimentations done, still being done to a certain degree on black bodies throughout history. That's what that character represents. These are some of the pages. I'm gonna probably revisit some of this stuff though. It's too dense. It brings us to, to almost the end. Planet Deep South is a offshoot of the black, of, excuse me, of astral blackness. Uh, I like this idea of like the South as kind of like this haunted space or like a re reclaiming like the black imaginary space. A lot of these people who are dealing with Afrofuturism as a, as a cultural production space are from the South, like Sun Ra, Henry Dumas, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Blowfly, you know, all those, all those folk are from the South, you know. And I like this idea of how um, using this particular type of um, ideology, like uh, Dr. King becomes Afrofuturist, or Fannie Lou Hamer becomes Afrofuturist, or you know, Medgar Evers becomes Afrofuturist, because it's about aspiring to get out of a particular space, to escape, you know? And so if you look at like, the work of like, Outkast, Janelle Monet, uh, Ornette Coleman, um, Henry Dumas, right, who I think is like the, I would say he's like the patron saint of this idea of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, because um, most of his work was, uh, was published posthumously by his best friend, um, Eugene Redman. And it was also, uh, co he also was helped by Toni uh, Morrison. He's a huge influence on Toni Morrison. He died really early. Uh, he was in Harlem coming from a Sun Ra concert and he was killed by a cop through mistaken identity. So you see how like these particular things have been happening for a while and intersecting with, you know, black speculative culture, which I think is kind of, Scary. This is David Banner, who's become like an Afrofuturist uh, uh, kind of uh, social justice uh, agent. He's a rapper, you know. And that, and that leads us to the cyber trap. I'm in with the cyber trap. So I was actually uh, invited uh, by Henry Jenkins and some other folk to go and talk about the legacies of cyberpunk. And I love cyberpunk as a space, but I was like, well, how does my work or how does other people work who's working in this space relate to cyberpunk? And he was looking at the Black Kirby um, kind of uh, work as relating to it. I was thinking about um, these notions of like the, of the trap, of the, of, of the cyber trap. Trap music basically is um, a, a really grungy, uh, drug-infested culture that deals, it's a, it's a music, it's a music uh, genre that's part of hip-hop culture. And, um, the early stuff is like T.I., U.G.K., those particular rappers. Uh, early outcasts deals with like this drug culture. Like today's trap music is very light in comparison to a lot of the early stuff like Feel Mob, Goody Mob, those particular, those particular rappers. 
So what happens when you infuse that with cyberpunk culture? So this is a world that I'm building right now that uh, with my friend Regina Bradley and my, Tim, my friend Tim Fielder, there's a future space that has been, um, it's a dystopian black urban space that deals with like te techno drugs and, and different things of that nature. But really what it is is a, it's a way to look at or to kind of telegraph some things that are happening in the South, particularly the black South. Because it seems like people aren't really paying attention out, outside of like the music culture and other things that are happening, right? And it's still romanticized to a, to a certain degree. So um, my friend um, Milton Davis just put out this book called uh, Cyberfunk, which is like black cyberpunk. So I would look at that, like this idea as being like a subgenre of that particular like, uh, kind of construction. So say all that to say is that I've been doing this, this work, uh, trying to escape Mississippi into like a, into like a virtual space to try to get the hell out of there, and I ended up back there. So it brings us to here. And I'm gonna stop talking, and you can reel me with questions. Thank you for attention. Hope I was riveting. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you for bearing with me. It's a lot of like stories. Sorry. And it's hot up here. <laughs> like, yeah. All right. So what we're gonna do is just Q and A for a while, and then uh, I'll I'll wrap it up by six thirty. Okay. And then I need to meet with the grad students about their food situation. Okay. I hope that was okay. Questions, comments, rude remarks. Go ahead. You just interact with John, them. Thanks, thanks very much. I wanted to ask, uh, I guess, about um, uh, some about collaboration, which you talked about you're, you're doing on different projects. Mm -hmm. Also, there's definitely this current of discussion of, you know, some of the differences between industrial production of comics, mm. Disney, and, uh, and paper page, and, and also the, the, uh, um, the way that tasks are divided by role, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. you know, um, and th that's quite different from selling comics out the back of a truck. Very much so. <laughs> and, uh, and from people who are, who are um, taking a role throughout the whole process. And, and so I guess my, my question is how, did, how, does, how does your practice, how does collaboration work for you and how do you help uh, students to uh, engage in these more productive, maybe less industrialized types of, of ways? Okay, um, you're right. I mean, I, and we, I was talking, we were speaking about this earlier, where the big two, Marvel and DC, aren't really comic book companies, really. They're more like IP farms, you know? And they just happen to be um, a leg of these huge multinational companies. Um, one of the things that I think uh, a lot of independent comics, Wait, you know what, let me, let me be more specific. I think a lot of the, the, the people who are African American who are making comics suffer from this notion of nostalgia as far as like they, they, they remember going to the stop and go and getting the comic books every month, you know, that kind of thing. And so they're thinking that that's the kind of thing that they want to do. I want to put out this book every month. Not realizing that, okay, you know what, there's a team of people making those books, there's a huge machine that's pushing those books out, you know, on, on a consistent basis. And there's a lot of work that goes into that, right? And it's a lot of mastery of particular skill sets, as you were saying, like inkers, writers, that kind of thing. Um, a, long, a while ago, I kind of let go of this idea of the lone artur working in the studio. I am a genius, and I shall make this thing, right? You know, and the students, I think, I think, particularly undergrad students, are still thinking about that notion. You know, so, I'm, so what I try to do is foster collaboration as much as possible, uh, breaking them up into groups, uh, forcing them to work with each other, you know, that kind of thing uh, in, various, in various types of spaces. And to show what's, what, what I'm doing with these types of collaborative uh, efforts, because to me, um, the story's got to get out. It's all about the story. And so I don't care if I have to share the IP, if I have to do colors on a project. Like with the, with the uh, Box of Bones project, uh, I drew one chapter of it, but I'm not drawing the rest of it. You know, I'm actually just doing the colors, and then my friend Damien's doing inking, and I basically have coerced you know, successfully six other artists to like invest their time in this and try to ha make something happen with it. Um, the economics of it are just staggering though because uh, there's, this there's this comic book called, uh, called Brother Man that actually was, was created in the 1990s and you can read about it here. Um, a whole family, the Sims family, they created this character that was supposed to like um, advertise an airbrush, uh, an airbrush business, right? Turns out that the comic books were actually more profitable than the airbrush business. They sold by hand 750,000 copies of that book. They had, I know, right? They had 11, 11 issues of it. Then what happened is like the mother and the father of Dawood's uh, parents died back to back and totally shut down the entire piece. So that would, 
at its highlight, that was, the, that, was the, that was the epitome of like collaboration, right? Because the parents were handling like some of the business, the brother was doing the writing, Dawood was drawing it, um, and uh, let's see, and that's also Guy Sands was writing it. So, so you could see like some of that, that cooperative economics happening there, right? Um, I try to foster those spaces through those, uh, those comic book conventions and through some of the, uh, the astral blackness work where people are sitting down with the people that are studying and coming up with different ways to attack those issues, I think. Um, yeah, I think, I think it probably is a fool's errand to, to try to make uh, comic books on a, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis like that. I'm thinking probably uh, smaller pieces like Band Designé, like 48-page like one-shot pieces or like proof-of-concept pieces or 60-page books and put them out like the French do it. Uh, keep your costs low, you know, uh, and, and do black and white books when you can, you know, which is one of the reasons why I like doing horror because it, it lends itself to it. Uh, that's another reason. And do uh, graphic novels and do uh, anthologies and, and that kind of thing where you can work with other people to put the stuff out, you know, and uh, keep the quality up and, uh, and, and, and get, to, get into those spaces where people can get the product. Because obviously there's a need for it, but they're not seeing it, you know, through the direct market. Because the other thing is that the direct market is a monopoly, right, which is owned by Diamond Distribution, right? So they have a stranglehold on a direct market. That's how people buy comic books, and it's very difficult to get into that space. Very difficult. So, uh, did, did that help? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, okay. Yes, sir. Just to pursue the, the collaboration idea, is this something that, that seems to work well with this particular medium? Is that an importance of this medium? I mean, a lot of media are necessarily collaborative, but the, the, the cost factor here is a little more controllable. Or is it something, you mentioned that Afrofuturists, a, a lot, you named a, a bunch of folks who are sort of creators in that space and said they're coming from the South. Is this coming from another, like, alternate economy kind of space? Yeah, maybe, it's, well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I, um, I've been talking about this earlier. We talked about this, this, this the cosmic Chitlin circuit idea earlier, right? Like, the Chitlin circuit was a way that black musicians, dis, you know, distributed their wares, right? So they would travel to mostly black spaces and they would play at juke joints, what have you. And even hip hop started that way. They actually would, because it was just race music, right, at first, before it, went, before it broke, broke wide. So what I've been trying to do is, what you're saying is like create a network of these alternative cons that actually become a space where um, people who are producing this type of uh, uh, consumable uh, story can actually make money doing this, right? And so that's, that's part of it, I think. As far as like the medium and affordances of the medium, I think that comics definitely are, can be a, a collaborative medium, but I think that also is uh, because of, of how they've been traditionally done too. So if you look at like a lot of really successful independent people like um, Dave Sim, for instance, who was doing Aardvark, uh, Cerebus Aardvark, I mean, he did everything himself, you know, that kind of, pretty much, I think, you know. So a lot of times you see those independent comics that are control, controlled by one lone person, but, um, you do see some really interesting collaborative things. Sometimes in like the, uh, the lower tier, like independent comics, like I look at like, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, they have like a, they have some really great collaborative uh, endeavors, like Fatal and like uh, uh, Incognito and a few other things that they've worked on together, but they just really work off of each other. Um, I, think, I, think the, I think the notion is to be open to, to sharing your ideas and not necessarily being as, um, you know, as capitalist minded, you know, because I really, I don't care about, uh, I do care, my money is awesome, I guess, you know, and it's, and it, but it's like, it's not, it's not the end all be all to me. I, I really want to see the stories happen. And I think if you could find people like that, if you're lucky enough to find people like that and that you can work with, and you're not like overly uh, territorial, that you can actually, in comics, do some really amazing things with it, you know, so, with the medium. Sash, yeah. Um, this is an amazing. Oh, thank you. So, Adrian Marie Brown and Wally David Marisha and uh, co-authors in Octavia's Brood, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And I know. Room should read it. Yeah. Um, you know, part of their proposal in Octavia's Brood is to say, you know, to think about how science fiction is essential to community organizing mm -hmm. and to the that is one of, of social movements yep. because it allows us to envision the possible alternative futures that, that we want to build. Right. Um, here at MIT, there's a lot of energy around building uh, technologies and possible futures, but a lot of them are stuck in a technotopian, uh, unmarked, and therefore normative, straight, white, wealthy, male mm. imaginary. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you imagine your own like, practice and pedagogy 
how how does it connect with with the designers and engineers and uh, makers and, and builders and the kind of the critical design theory and practice that you're right. talking about? What what, is, what does that look like programmatically? Like how do you? Do I'm trying to figure it out yeah. a little bit because and this is what we talked about earlier as far as like the intersections between various modes of study. Uh, I've been thinking about like race as a construction, right? Maybe even race as a diegetic prototype that was really successful. You know what I'm saying? So that kind of idea, because it keeps popping up. And then, but also intersecting with like various types of legibility issues, you know? So I'm thinking about what I've been putting out there as like critical race design studies, you know, which I didn't necessarily put in the talk, but it's something that I'm kind of like thinking about. Um, the black body as a type of text, various types of like design thinking that engages with uh, critical race theory, like traditional cr critical race theory. Because if you think about it, um, Derek Bell's work actually started out in speculative work. He's one of the forefathers of critical race theory, right? But he was using, what well, you're talking about, these, these, these story uh, uh, prompts as ways to talk about alternative ways to think about law, right? Because critical race theory comes out of the law profession, right? Derek Bell was a, I think it was at Harvard, right? When he at Harvard? I think he was, yeah, as I recall. And so, you know, you ever seen Space Traders, for instance? Uh, Space Traders is this story that he made up to talk about property and race, actually. So what happens in Space Traders is like, um, it's said in the 80s, these aliens come down, right? And they say, hey, we will fix everything on your planet. We'll give you a gajillion dollars. That's, that's a lot of money. Also, um, we will clean up the entire world, right? will fix every problem that you have systemically if you give us all your population with a certain amount of melanin content. Right. So, so they had to vote. <laughs> you know, they had to vote. There was actually like, it's interesting because uh, HBO did this thing called Cosmic Slop, which is based off of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Parliament Funkadelic song, right? Where um, they made this into a series. It was called, it, well, it wasn't a series. It was supposed to be a series. It was a pilot by the Hudlin Brothers where they actually did, it was almost like a, Afrofuturist like uh, Twilight Zone, right? You can actually find pieces of this out on the uh, on the web, but that space trader story is what I'm talking about. Like, where you use narrative and critical uh, thinking about race, and then overlap that into these like you know these kind of fictional spaces. How do you, how do, what does that look like? You know, so, yeah. So I'm I'm still working out if this thing is going to be like a class or special topics course, or is it a new way of thinking about design and and, and critical race theory? I, I don't know yet. You know, so I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. But I know it's going to probably have a huge critical making component. Um, I mean, like, too huge. But design history, probably media studies, various modes of thinking to kind of, like, come together and form this kind of idea around how to talk about those things. Because you're right. Issues like the cyber trap, for instance, that could really happen. I mean, the cyber trap could actually happen, <laughs> you know, down south. It really could. So how do you map those types of like racialized spaces? Because it's a very racialized space with science fiction and fantasy, you know, and create worlds like that. So I'm, I'm still working through it. But I think that, uh, I don't know, I think I'm on the right track. I'm looking forward to devoting some time to it. That's for sure. So that's a half answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Ian. Yes, I'm Ian, man. How you doing? <laughs> I'm like, and so I'm wondering, it's really amazing all the stuff you do, the drawing, the art, the curation, the community building. Uh, is, is there a, an analytical component to your work as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Actually, um, I have a book out right now that I did a co-edited piece called The Black of the Ink that actually just won a book award. I'm like, oh, PCA, ACA for best uh, edited uh, collection. So I do like some uh, analysis as well. Um, there's this really cool... Uh, uh, it's, collection called uh, What is a Superhero that I talk about. It's called um, Superhero by Design, looking like the semiotics of, superhero, of superheroes. And yeah, so like, I do like some, some formal and critical analysis of the work too. Um, right now I'm like, I'm really into the, into the making because honestly I reach more people, you know? The 10 people that's gonna, that are gonna buy the book that I won this award for, 20 people maybe, you know, that, that are like my my peers, you know, that's not necessarily who I need to speak to. So I'm like, you know, so what I try to, what I try to do is actually work in a narrative structure because we're made out of stories. Whether you like it or not, we just keep editing them over and over again. So a lot of my energy is going that way because I know that I can reach more people. 6,000 people are not going to buy that book that I just told you about. So that's, that's where my head is right now, but I do that kind of work too because it's in, I like it. I like talking about ideas and I love like uh, that type of, uh, that type of engagement that um, a lot of times it's informing 
historically informing the work that I'm making. So, yes, sir. Um, thank you for this I mean, just amazing talk. Um, I just wanted to, I'm curious, comic stories are so inherently a multiple medium, right? Yes, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I love it. Making a comic representation of you know, an incredibly famous prose work. Yes, yeah. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about um, what the experience was of trying to extract from that prose world something that you could, you know, you know, crossing medium as well as transforming that sort of singular approach to making the story. Yeah, it's... Multiple ways you give story in the comic book. It's so difficult. That's the first thing. Whew. So, so here's the thing, this is our, like, we're working from our second draft of this thing, like, they totally just tore to pieces, like, this other alternative view of the story that we were trying to put out, because first thing was, like, point of view, right? Um, we're thinking, like, okay, well, if people are gonna buy this adaptation, obviously they've already read Kindred, right? No, not so much, because here's the thing, the people that actually got us to do that particular job um, had just stumbled across Octavia Butler, had just found her, this woman, our wonderful editor, Sheila Keenan, um, she was still at Abrams Comic Arts, that's where, who's putting it out. She, 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 she came across her, and she's been working in publishing for like 20, 30 years. 20 years, you know, and not heard of this particular, this amazing writer, right? And the president of the company was taking a night class and came across the narrative. So I say all that to say is that we had to readjust our approach and pull out some of the more visceral parts of it. It's very difficult because even in the sketches, the brutality of the story, it's a very dark narrative. It's not a feel good anything, you know? And so I find myself uh, trying to, I mean, it's very difficult like, when, you, when you're talking about like, okay, how do you, what panels do you describe a whipping through? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh my God, it was like five whippings in, in the story. So, so trying to pull out those narratives and, and actually trying to figure out like spatially how these things are working. And then also using the affordances of comics like diagrammatically, because there's one particular part where like Dana, the main character, has like this bag. And uh, so we use cutaways and things that comics do really well diagrammatically to tell the story. So for instance, if things are happening simul simultaneously on various floors, we have things like that, that comics do really well. Um, I like your comment about like the multimodal nature of comics too, because one of the things I really love about them, you know, um, is that they can talk about reading in various ways easily because they kind of have synthesis to a certain degree of image and text, you know? And um, that's one of the things I always push when I'm talking to teachers, like, okay, well, we're not really taught how to read those types of images early on, unless you're in a program like this, right? Um, and why is that? I'm always leery about that. Like, why are people not trained to read images that way early on, like as kids, you know, that kind of thing? Um, and how comics can be a facilitator for that. So it's been very difficult. I think the process of doing the breakdowns of the pages has been very helpful in pulling out the right, uh, the right images. So what I'm doing right now is I'm drawing the entire book as sketches, right? The entire book, I'm on page 198 right now. <laughs> it's a 240 page book. So what's happening is I'm doing the breakdowns, Damon's gonna do lettering, all that stuff has to be redone, right? But we're still knowing exactly what the framing mechanism is gonna be. There's a whole part of the stories that had to be edited out that we just could not deal with, you know, because the book is actually longer than the graphic novel, right? So I think the heart of the story is going to be there, but it's a very difficult uh, trans translation. And I'm, I'm happy to be doing it, but I'm, I don't know if I want to do that kind of thing. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of pressure, too, because it's a beloved book, you know. So I hope that answered your question. All right. Yes, sir. You said a few things about your teaching. Could you say a little more about your teaching? It's wild. I like to make the students uncomfortable. <laughs> I do. I do because I, I don't. I really don't bite my tongue about the political aspects of what design does. And we were talking about this earlier. How like essentially I'm teaching people how to manipulate people, right? I mean, graphic design for the most part is in service of you know capitalism and all that good stuff. And I'm giving them the tools to. Uh, to, to, to sell things to people. And so um, I was talking earlier about like creating the first ethics course at University of Illinois. It was called Edge, Ethics of the, of the Designer in a Global Economy. We were thinking about from various types of ethical standpoints, okay, so who are you working for? Why are you working for this person? Um, 
outside of just paying for your absorbent student loans, how are you going to keep your sanity? How are you going to actually keep your humanity and work in this particular industry? Because it eats ideas like candy, eats them, you know, spits it back out at you. That's what it does really well, you know. And um, I'm glad I didn't go into like the corporate sector. Um, I've actually seen what happens to someone that goes into the corporate sector like that. Uh, I was talking to this gentleman. He was the first African-American uh, to have like a really successful advertising company. And um, I forgot his name right now. But he has this book called, uh, called Brainwashed, right? And he talks about the power of images, particularly around like, you know, the black image. And so these types of ideas I do bring into the, I bring into the, into the classroom and say, okay, look, I'm presenting these things to you, you know, so you'll know once you're going out there trying to get a job, in the image creation industry, because that's what they're doing. You're manipulating images and selling these things to people. Uh, so I do make people uncomfortable you know, on purpose, because I do believe in a little discomfort when you're talking about learning, because you know, they're safe. They're safe. It's like, oh, it's going to be cool. But um, I try to do things that are more thematic. Like, for instance, um, in my applied semiotics course, I change the theme up from time to time. Like, right now, the theme is, let's say, no, I'm not teaching that course right now. Next year is probably going to be, I'm going to call it primary. We're going to like deal like connotations of primary colors, and the students have to create their own, own products, projects according to the connotations of the colors. You know, that's going to make them really comfortable because they're so used to like checking off boxes. You know? There's no, that's, that doesn't really happen in, in my classes, actually. It's a lot of like, uh, um, there's a lot of wrestling with the problem because it's visual. They, I'm teaching them a methodology of thinking. You know? so, so it just happens to have a, a deliverable, right? but it's a thought process, and that's what I'm trying to teach them about. Uh, right now, I'm teaching this course called Hip Hop and uh, Visual Culture because I do like a lot of teaching around like hip hop and, uh, and visual uh, thinking. And um, the idea, I'm just making them all into little CJs, like sampling, remixing things constantly, like mixing up things and putting them out there into the world. You know, that's what, they, that's what we do. And you're constantly, um, you know, agitated by the, the stuff that you, uh, that you consume, right? So I try to have like a really serious like media theory like component to the courses, but it always ends up in a studio course with something that's made. I don't want them to necessarily leave with a portfolio to go get a gig. Honestly, I'd rather that they do other things, but you know, I think that at the, at the end of the day, uh, I want them to be uh, citizens who just happen to be designers. You know, that's what I really want. I want them to be like active citizens who are makers of these things and actually being very conscious about what, what they're doing ethically with the work that they're making. So, and all my classes are centered around that idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right.